everybody. Uh, this is your friend from the Portland Branch Library, Mr. William, and I am so excited to join you today for story time. And I'm glad that you uh, tuned in to, to join me for uh, story time. Because we are in uh, the month of February, I decided I would share some books that uh, have to do with some famous African Americans because this is Black History or African American History Month, as well as being the month of, of Valentine's Day. And so I'll share a little bit of something involving Valentine's as well. And so to start off, before we get uh, into our books and stories, if you will join me in a hello song. First, we're going to say, hello, hello. Can you clap your hands? And you can clap your hands three times. Hello, hello. Can you stomp your feet? And you can stomp your feet three times. And then, can you raise them high? Can you go down low? Can you turn around? Can you say hello? All right, you ready? On three. One, two, three. Hello, hello. Can you clap your hands? <laughs> hello, 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 hello. Can you stomp your feet? Can you lift them high? Can you go down low? Can you turn around? Can you say hello? All right, can we do it again one more time? All right, on three. One, two, three. Hello, 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 hello. Can you clap your hands? <laughs> hello, 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 hello. Can you stomp your feet? Can you lift them high? Can you reach down low? Can you turn around? Can you say hello? Hello, glad that you're here. And so for our first story, I would like to share this one. This one is entitled Above the Rim. Above the Rim, and what do you see here? Did you say a basketball player? You're correct. And this basketball player is a famous basketball player who played basketball several, well, quite a few years ago. He played basketball before LeBron James did and before uh, Kobe Bryant or Shaq or Magic Johnson. Uh, his name is Elgin Baylor, Elgin Baylor. And we're gonna learn a little bit about him. All right. On a steamy summer day in 1945, a boy and his brothers played stickball in the streets. There were plenty of nice parks in Washington, D.C., where people swam or played tennis, basketball, and baseball. But the child was black, and those parks were whites only. Sometimes late at night when the city was asleep, the older boys tunneled under the padlocked fences and played there anyway. But things can change in time. The child knew time was important. That's why his own name, Elgin, came from his father's favorite watch. He was 14 when a hoop appeared in the field down the street. And this time, there was no whites only sign. It wasn't fancy, just a place to play basketball, a fine game of skill and strategy and of running back and forth, a flat-footed game as level as the court itself. Now Elgin and his friends could play it too. At first, they didn't have the right equipment, so they played with a tennis ball. Then someone found a volleyball. And then finally, yes! A real basketball. And look at the guys playing basketball. Some of the older boys were very good and they knew it. Hey, you see that shot I made, one bragged? That's nothing. You should see the shot I blocked, another boasted. Oh yeah? Well, you just try to slide by me, another challenged. 
Elgin heard what they said, but bragging was not his style. On the court, he let his body do the talking. In one smooth move, like a plane taking off, he would leap higher and higher and higher as if pulled by some invisible wire. And just when it seemed he'd have to come down, no. He'd hang there suspended, floating like a bird or a cloud, changing direction, shifting the ball to other side, twisting in midair, slashing, crashing, gliding past the defense, up, up, up above the rim and with a flick of his wrist or a roll off the fingertips, he put the ball in. The way he played was so different that people stopped what they were doing and watched him. Where he, did he learn those moves? The other players asked. Elgin didn't have an answer. I don't know, he told them. It's spontaneous. Elgin grew taller and stronger. He jumped higher and leaped longer. His friends called him Rabbit. At All Black Springarn High, Elgin brought his outdoor moves inside. He could score from anywhere on the floor, a hanging jumper from the corner or a drive inside spin shot off the backboard. He's unstoppable, the other teams complained. Go, rabbit, go, the fans cried as Elgin leaped, turned, and twisted toward the rim, gave a quick head fake, and reverse dunked over him. Whenever Elgin played, people stopped what they were doing and watched. After high school, Elgin wanted to go to college, but the D.C. colleges wanted whites only. You should come out west, said a friend who went to the College of Idaho. So, Elgin did. It rained hard those first few days, but when the skies cleared, it was time for a game. And soon people in Idaho stopped what they were doing and watched. No one else played that way, the coaches declared. Where did he learn those moves, they wondered. Elgin didn't have an answer. I don't know, he told them. It's spontaneous. Means that he just did it naturally. That winter, Elgin led his college team to victory. And that winter, far away in Alabama, a black woman named Rosa Parks sat down on a city bus and refused to give up her seat to a white man. That was a victory, too. When people learned about Rosa on the news, they stopped what they were doing and watched. And you've probably heard of Rosa Parks, haven't you? Later, Elgin transferred to Seattle where he led his team to the 1958 college championship finals. The newspapers wrote a lot about Elgin. They also wrote about the courage of the first black students in Arkansas to sit down in an all-white classroom. All across the country, people stopped what they were doing and watched. In 1958, the Minneapolis Lakers chose Elgin Baylor first. Out of all the college players in the nation, Elgin Rabbit Baylor was now a professional athlete. But in those days, being in the NBA was not like it is today. Fans flocked to watch Major League Baseball, with, but with only eight teams, the NBA had a hard time selling tickets. The players didn't make that much money. They traveled long distances in loud clickety-clack trains and slept leaning over in their seats, their long legs jammed underneath. Sometimes they flew in made-over cargo planes. They played back-to-back -back nights and washed their uniforms in hotel bathrooms. They slept on beds that were too short. They played when they were injured or sick. Even so, Elgin played as hard as he could, and so did his Lakers teammates. Meanwhile, another team gathered in the basement of a church in Wichita, Kansas. They practiced sitting down and not fighting back. Even if they were bullied, 
and harassed. Later, they sat down at a white only counter, lunch counter, until they were served food. But change came slower elsewhere. That winter in West Virginia, when the Lakers needed a place to stay overnight, every hotel said whites only. So Elgin and his teammates said, no thanks. The whole team checked into Edna's guest house, where anyone was welcome. They were hungry. Where could they eat? Downtown, all the nice restaurants were whites only. Elgin bought some cold food at the bus station and ate in his room. And see, it, there's a sign, we serve white only. That night, as the other players suited up and walked onto the court, Elgin sat down before the crowd. Look at him sitting down without a uniform. Why isn't Elgin Baylor out there, the reporters asked. It's not fair, the fans complained. We play to watch the whole team. But his coach and his teammates understood. They were with him at the hotel. They knew he'd been turned away at restaurants. I'm a human being, Elgin told them, and I want to be treated like one. Sometimes you have to sit down to stand up, and that's what Elgin did. Even during the basketball game, he decided not to play because he wanted to be treated fairly. The fans noticed, the newspapers noticed, and the NBA commissioner noticed. A few weeks later, he made a new rule. No NBA teams would stay in a hotel or eat in a restaurant that practiced discrimination. Discrimination means that you treat people differently uh, and unfairly. Elgin had already changed the way basketball was played. Now, by sitting down and not playing, he helped change things off the court, too. In 1959, Elgin was voted NBA Rookie of the Year. Two years later, the Lakers moved to Los Angeles, California, where, where famous people seemed to be everywhere. Fame changed people, Elgin knew, but it didn't change Elgin. In one smooth move, like a plane taking off, he leaped higher and higher and higher, as if pulled by some invisible wire. And just when it seemed he'd have to come down, no. He'd hang there, suspended, floating like a bird or a cloud, changing direction, shifting the ball to the other side, twisting in midair, slashing and crashing, gliding past the defense, up, up, up above the rim. And with a flick of his wrist or a roll off his fingertips, he put the ball in. Wherever Elgin played, people stopped what they were doing and watched. And that's the story of Above the Rim by Jen Bryant, and it was illustrated by Frank Morrison. I like that story. How about you? And if you'd like, uh, I'd like to join you in uh, singing another song, one of my favorites, If You're Happy and You Know It. And I know you know this one. All right. On three. One, two, three. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, raise your hands. If you're happy and you know it, raise your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, raise your hands. If you're happy and you know it, shout hooray, hooray! 
If you're happy and you know it, shout hooray, hooray! If you're happy and you know it, then your face will truly show it. If you're happy and you know it, shout hooray, hooray! All right, good job, good job. All right, uh, I'd like to, to go with another story. Uh, let's see. Since we're continuing to talk about black history and African-American history, let's look at this book here. This one is called Dream Big, Little One. And this particular book um, tells of some famous African-American women who've done great things. And you may know uh, some of the names of some of these famous women as we read the story. Uh, this one is called Dream Big, Little One, and it's written by Vashti Harrison. Dream big, little one. There's so much you can do. Just look at all the leaders who came before you. Reach for the stars like Mae, Bessie, and Catherine. Mae Jemison went all the way to space. She was a astronaut and she was the first uh first black woman astronaut bessie coleman flew her airplane high katherine johnson helped send a man to the moon be bold like josephine shirley and maya Josephine Baker was a singer, a dancer, and a spy. Shirley Chisholm ran for president. Maya Angelou used her voice every way she could. Go the distance like Wilma, Raven, and Florence. Wilma Rudolph couldn't walk but learned to run. Raven Wilkinson danced all around the world. Florence Joyner was the fastest woman of all time. Find your stage like Ella, Nina, Oprah, Gwen, and Nichelle. Ella Fitzgerald was the first lady of jazz. Nina Simone had a style all her own. Oprah Winfrey, I bet you've heard of her, shined her light on others. Gwen Ifill Ifil reported the truth. Nichelle Nichols trekked through the stars on TV. She was on Star Trek a few years ago. <laughs> Express your creativity like Alma, Augusta, Octavia, and Julie. Alma Woodsy Thomas painted her whole life and became a star at 80. Augusta Savage sculpted toys when she had none. Octavia E. Butler created magical worlds. Julie Dash shared untold stories in the movies she made. Wherever you go, whatever you do, be bold and dream big. The world is waiting for you. And that's the book, Dream Big, Little One. <laughs> this book I wanted to share because, as I said, this month we're going to celebrate Valentine's Day. And you may see from some of the decorations, uh, we're, we're uh, celebrating Valentine's Day. And Valentine's Day is a time where we get to tell the folks, uh, family and friends, uh, how, how much we love them, how much we care about them. This book is entitled, If You'll Be My Valentine, by Cynthia Ryland and illustrated by Fumi Kasaka. If you'll be my valentine.
If you'll be my valentine, I'll kiss you on the nose. I'll scratch your ears and rub your head and pet your little toes. Oh, look. If you'll be my valentine, I'll give you extra treaties. I'll give you two and maybe three and let you lick my feeties. <laughs> Little puppy is licking boy's foot. <laughs> if you'll be my valentine, I'll take you on a walk. I'll pull the wagon just for you and we can sing and talk. If you'll be my valentine, I'll write a special letter. I'll add some hugs and kisses too and make it even better. And look what that says. It says, dear grandma. So he made a special valentine for his grandmother, which you can do that too. If you'll be my valentine, I'll sit with you today. We'll read a book about some frogs if you don't want to play. And look, he's reading a book with his little brother. If you'll be my valentine, I'll take you in my car. You'll sit up front so you can look, but we won't go too far. Oh, look, he's got his teddy bear with him, taking him for a ride. If you'll be my valentine, I'll sing a song for you. And when you fly up in the sky, then you can sing one too. Singing with the birdie. If you'll be my valentine, I'll pour out tea at three. Spicy cookies and an orange just for you and me. Oh, that's nice. He's having tea with his mom. That's something that you may want to do with your mother. If you'll be my valentine, I'll make you funny faces. You can make them back at me when we go different places. <laughs> if you'll be my valentine, then I'll be one for you. We'll love the trees and all the world. We'll love each other too. Happy Valentine's Day, and happy Valentine's Day to you and your family. That's if you'll be my Valentine. And I hope that you have plenty of love to share with the Valentines in your life. Well, I again just want to uh, thank you for joining us for story time. Uh, it's been really fun and uh, really great time. I'm Always glad to share great books with you, and I think we've had some great stories today. I just want to wish you happy Valentine and also um, happy American, Black American History Month as well. Enjoy this time and learn about uh, some uh, famous, well-known, uh, and influential uh, African Americans. You really gain from that and it'll really help help you out I'm sure I want to just say goodbye to you guys and uh, looking forward to the next time we'll spend together if you want to join me uh, in the I love you song since we're talking about love and valentines uh, let's do that all right you ready on three one two three I love you you love me we're a happy family with a great big hug and a kiss from me to you. Won't you say you love me too? I love you. You love me. We're a happy family with a great big hug and a kiss from me to you. Won't you say you love me? Me too. I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you.